Hi everybody, Mary Long here, Flannery Painter Chicago, and uh, tonight I'm absolutely thrilled. We have Scott Gelatly with us, who is uh, somebody that I've been taking uh, a class from. Uh, and uh, as I uh, sat, I think it was probably the first week I knew we had to have him here as a guest artist. Um, and as Scott started talking about color, I realized that um, with all the different classes I've taken over the last six years, and I have taken many, um, Scott did this amazing job to talk about color and painting. And so I asked Scott um, to join us. And so Scott, thank you very much for uh, doing so. And thanks for uh, coming along with us tonight. And I'm gonna um, spotlight you. Um, and there he is. Um, and Scott, you're in Portland, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm um, born and raised in Portland. And so I live about 10, 15 uh, minutes just west of uh, downtown Portland. Oh, that's great. And yeah. and Scott, um, you know, you just mentioned him being with Gamblin and, and uh, uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your art and, you know, just give us some background. Yeah, you bet. Um, so I have a degree in painting and drawing from the University of Oregon. Uh, painting and drawing is something that I've always done. So it was kind of a natural decision for me to pursue it in college. and. Uh, got out of school in, let's see, 98, and went to work immediately in the art material industry, uh, both on the retail setting, and then just as, as Mary mentioned, um, from 2005 to 2000, to uh, just earlier this year, uh, was uh, at Gamblin Artist Colors, uh, manufacturer of oil painting materials here in Portland, Oregon. And I um, spent most of my role there at Gamblin as product manager. So um, R&D, um, product development, uh, product improvements uh, that, we, that we did there at Gamblin, um, as well as some of the um, outreach, so the content that was on the website, the video demonstrations. I led a team of um, artist representatives across the country to give lecture demonstrations on our behalf. And um, as 2020 ten has shaped up to be a year of uh, many transitions, uh, it was for me too. So um, as of May, I um, to, taken the plunge to focus all of my efforts into my own painting and my own teaching. Um, I've been exhibiting my work and continuing uh, to paint ever since I got out of college. So I've been active in that for uh, 22 years or so. And um, my work has always been very much driven by the landscape. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, the class that I was, have been teaching this year that Mary took was abstracting the landscape. And this, I think, fits and describes my approach to my painting for the last 20 years. Uh, whether, and that always kind of shifts between uh, paintings that are a bit more representational um, in nature, working from direct observation, plein air, to works that are just inspired by the landscape that take on a, a bit more um, abstracted quality to them. So, so Scott, uh, I see your name uh, that you've been doing the plein air competitions. So um, what percentage kind of studio plein air do you do? Oh, let's see. Um, it's really evolved quite a bit over the last um, few years, but I would say from maybe 2014 through 2018, I was really um, heavy into the different plein air competitions. Um, Door County uh, was one that I did in uh, 2014. Uh, Sedona plein air um, in Arizona. Uh, the Olmstead Plain Air in Atlanta, 
And then since its inception in, I think, 2004, I've done the Pacific Northwest Plain Air uh, event here uh, that is a fabulous event. Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen this year, but uh, it takes place along the Columbia River Gorge in between Oregon and Washington here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been doing these events. Um, my work was really heavy into plein air painting um, for a long stretch of, of years, I would say from about uh, 2012 to 2018. Um, since then, I've taken more of an approach that I really let my plein air work kind of be a means to an end and inform my studio work rather than exhibit a lot of the plein air work that I do. Um, my work plein air has shifted um, recently into from doing a lot of finished oil paintings to doing a lot of quick um, sketchbook size uh, water media. So watercolor, gouache, casein, um, acrylic gouache out in the field. And it's a bit quicker. It's a bit more spontaneous, uh, responsive. And I, tr part of this is practicality. That just, it fits in my life a little bit better. Um, and part of it too is that I've I treat my plain air work more as um, kind of a visual journal that I create that really feeds my studio work. Um, you don't have to, happen to have your journal, your uh, sketchbook right there, do you? Uh, I don't, but I can, I've got a PowerPoint that has a number of the sketches in it that I can screen share real quick. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I was really uh, impressed by it. And, uh, Can everyone, everyone see this? It's called yes. Plain Air Works. Okay. Uh, so these are just a few pieces that, um, that I've done. I think just in the last, let's see, 2017, 2018. So some fairly recent Plain Air pieces. Um, again, really color driven, uh, which is kind of the topic uh, of this critique uh, tonight. Uh, I was focused uh, for a s many years on really dramatic uh, skies with intense color. <clears throat> uh, we talked a little bit as people were just coming on about uh, plain air while traveling. Uh, so these are a number of pieces that I did um, a couple years back when my family and I uh, traveled around Europe. Beautiful. Thanks. Uh, here's uh, a plein air piece from two years ago that really sparked my interest in um, painting from these small area wetlands um, around my home here in Portland. And then here's, um, I guess, 16 of these little on-site uh, water media paintings. So uh, most of these are measure about four inches by six and a half inches. Yeah. And I just tape out uh, with, you know, blue masking tape, the edges around these Strathmore watercolor sketchbooks. And these are a combination of watercolor, gouache, casein, um, pretty, pretty small, pretty quick paintings, but really focusing in on color interactions, uh, gesture and line that is um, that is, in, is informed by the landscape as well as just compositions just finding uh, little motions and interactions of color and one of my uh, one of my goals with these this series in plein air painting is you know many of these are done at this, the exact same spot um, but I, I try to find what's the what's the smallest thing I can do to make a painting? What's the smallest excuse or little inspiration in the landscape to make something interesting happen with it? 
Uh, so that's really kind of taken the place of, of my oil painting out in the field. Again, it's mostly because of like practicality and the time that I have to go out and paint. Um, but I, I find that the process is really uh, rewarding. Yeah, this is wonderful. And uh, if people have questions for Scott, we'll answer them afterward if we have time. So if you have questions about what Scott is doing here. Also, let me just take this moment to say that because of um, the fabulous class I've been taking with Scott, well, it's over now, but um, uh, I asked him if he would do a class for us. And so there is a workshop coming up the 25th of August and the 1st of uh, September. Uh, and there is still some space in there, although I, I don't know how, how much space at this point. But um, if you're interested, I will be sending out the promotion again um, to you. And it's just for our membership. Uh, so, um, you know, you, you can see what Scott's doing here. So I hope you'll join us. Uh, you'll see how much I, um, why I, I really appreciate it. So, so Scott, tell us about how you're going to uh, critique tonight. How are you thinking about um, our critiques? your critique of our work. Right, right. So I think the first kind of holistic approach that I take to any critique is um, I try to get into the artist intention behind the painting. And if that is communicated by the painting, that's, that's the framework in which I try to look at each individual painting, is trying to really think about what the intention behind that painting is. So um, for instance, if, if one is painting in a very expressionistic style and using a lot of kind of broken bravado of, of brushwork, you know, I'm not going to I'm going to treat that differently than I would if the intention was something that was um, more rendering of detail mm -hmm. and a tighter hand in that. Um, so I, first off is I, I really try to tap into the um, intention that the, art, the artist is using in that particular painting. Uh, the second aspect is, um, you know, an emphasis on color and the color is really the the main filter in which I'm going to be looking at a lot of this work through. Uh, so again that is part and parcel to uh, intention behind, painter, behind the painting and then I always feel like one way to really drive a composition in a painting is the use of uh, color and the use of value. So if I um, think about composition and talk to that a bit, it's really how color and value both drive uh, the viewer's eye through the painting and what can be improved upon in composition that is, that is driven by color and value. Uh, subject matter is certainly part of that. Uh, it, you know, some paintings might have a very clear center of um, focus or um, an area of interest. Uh, so I might speak to that as it relates to color and composition. Uh, the other thing I wanna note too, because I, I did um, kind of read the, the guidelines for posting, and I know many of you posted a, a reference image um, along with the painting. Uh, I will try, I'm going to, I always think it's important for a painting to be judged on its own terms. So I'm not going to um, judge it in response to, you know, the accuracy against the, um, the reference image. That to me, it, it's nice to see it. It's nice to see where these images come from. But I think every painting uh, needs to kind of work on its own terms um, away from you know either the landscape that it's painted in or the image uh, that you're using as a reference. So I, I might look to that to say you know maybe talk a little bit about color um, but I'm really going to be focusing on just the paintings. 
That's great. Yeah, many of us uh, use artist license. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> I was given that card myself too, and I've used it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a nice thing about it. Well, yeah. um, is there anything else you want to mention or anything? It, um, or we can just get started if you'd like to share your Facebook page. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I think the other thing I'll mention too is that it's always been a philosophy of mine of just from a learning aspect and getting sharing um, my opinions that I always point out, I think it's a learning opportunity um, to, for me to point out what's working well in a painting and what can be improved upon. Uh, so, you know, I, I really try to offer both. So Scott, this is great. I think uh, those are all things that we would appreciate. And uh, um, please have at it. Go ahead and uh, share your screen. And um, I think we have a pretty good idea where we start. And I'll keep you on track um, if you need it. <laughs> OK. Yep, that's the first one. You're on all it. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, so um, this one, you know, one of the, the subjects that I'll always talk about in my workshops is approaches and strategies to creating color harmony. And this one works really well as an analogous uh, color grouping. Um, yellow greens, blue greens, and, and blues essentially those colors that are adjacent to each other uh, in the, around the color wheel. And this, this painting speaks to that uh, quite well. I also appreciate that the, there's a strategy that's created here with the analogous color approach, but then uh, there's areas that that is broken up a bit uh, through the subtle use of these pinks and maybe orangish yellows uh, with the, the flowers just to, to break up that um, analogous approach. Uh, the uh, rendering of this is uh, really done quite well. I really, this is I think a really great example of how composition is driven by color and value. So oftentimes in landscape paintings and the way we just read landscape paintings and the way we re read the world really is that, you know, we, towards the bottom is close. As we go up to, uh, up to the top of the painting, we generally move uh, farther back into pictorial space. Uh, but I, I really appreciate how there's this curving and movement from the bottom up to um, the distant areas of the water and up towards uh, the Hancock building. I was corrected earlier. Um, and what makes this painting really interesting for me is this little spot right here. Without this, it would be a much less interesting. And sometimes it takes something really small to just make a little, make a big difference in a painting. So I like that the eye is driven there. There's obviously that importance on a very recognizable landmark there in Chicago, but just the fact that there's something else there, like a figure crossing the bridge is, is incredibly interesting for this. Uh, one thing that I would uh, maybe suggest uh, as, a, as a place to go with this is kind of comes back to creating a, a strategy and then breaking the strategy, uh, bringing in maybe a bit more of those uh, reddish um, violets or those stronger pinks. Uh, there's a subtle quality of some uh, warmer violets in the reflected sky in the water, a bit more in the sky itself. I think bringing in some of those warmer colors opposite the green and blues uh, from the color wheel. Uh, so 
a bit more pinks, orange pinks, warmer violets, just in a few more subtle areas just to break that dominance of um, blues and greens would really, I think, propel this painting even a step further. Um, and I, I do appreciate how uh, the atmospheric perspective in this piece takes over and um, kind of uh, obscures these buildings in the background. I think that could actually be done even more so. Um, I think that that, you know, the, the recognizable Hancock building there, um, I understand why it's a little bit deeper in value to put a little bit more emphasis on it, but I think treating this whole cityscape as a plane that sits back uh, could maybe have a cast of a slightly lighter and bluer veil um and value over the entire area would just push that back a bit more and put the emphasis um a bit more on that really interesting patterning of and movement within the reflected water and the bridge thank you scott thank you great piece appreciate it <clears throat> okay um looks like this is the next one and uh, really interesting um just wonderful color harmony in this piece um i mentioned a, a moment ago about just um creating a strategy and then breaking the strategy with a um analogous color palette. What this piece does really well that breaks that, um, what I call like the, the holy trinity of, of landscape colors as like green, blue, and gray, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, and the importance of kind of breaking that um, at times. What does it for me in this piece in particular is the treatment of those warm greens. So there's really quite a bit of, of yellow. I'm gonna kind of annotate and point some of this out. So the, the warmth that this warm green takes on with a bit of orange in it. Uh, the pinks right in this area, uh, the subtle, oops, the subtle um, oranges that creep into that, um, that land color in the very foreground, the subtle violets uh, that work their way into not only the foreground, but also into the underbelly of the sky. Um, that really helps to break up uh, this strong analogous colors um, system really well. Um, the, the paint handling I think is really interesting as well. Um, there's kind of a, a quality that um, that I, I really love in landscape paintings when I can feel the temperature of the day, the humidity, uh, the time of day, um, really puts me in that place. And I think the graying out of the colors in the background uh, helps do that quite a bit. Um, as well as, like I said, that warmth that all the warm greens take on. It's a, it seems to me like a very late summer quality with the color palette here. Um, a couple suggestions is maybe just the kind of the edge work and the value of the blue of the water. Um, And I, I, I realize that it can be that blue, but I think the, the sharpness of the edge 
of, I'm going to annotate this one more time here. Oh. So the, the quality of this like land area being so close to the horizon of the water. You know, this is one of those things that was, you probably saw it just like this, how that flattened out just, but it, it seems a little too compressed into that area. So what I would, um, one approach to, to remedy that is maybe bring this land up just slightly you know, keeping the yeah. same color, but making that um, have a bit more topography to elevate it against the water line of the horizon. And also maybe um, lighten just slightly the value of the water. Um, but I think this is just a wonderful quality that a uh, painting that depicts, you know, the, um, the color palette of the landscape, but also the time of day, humidity, time of year. Uh, you know, that's, that's to me is just, you, you, as a landscape painter, you wanna put the viewer into the landscape um, and express how a landscape feels. And this painting very much does that. Um, you know, it's one of the things I've always loved about like Edward Hopper's work or Fairfield Porter's work. It really puts the viewer into that landscape. And I think this is working in that, um, in a similar way. Scott, who were, you said Hopper and who was the other person? Uh, Fairfield Porter. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, Scott. I appreciate that. Looking forward yeah. to the, uh, I'm looking forward to the workshop. Excellent, me too. Yeah. All right. Um, I, and I think this one too continues on the same theme of really expressing uh, the time of day. Uh, this one, I, I did know that there was a, Yeah, I think on some of these, I have to get out of it to see the reference photo and then get back onto the, the painting. Um, so what I'm immediately drawn to with this painting is the shifting color of the sky and that fleeting quality of light uh, that is so wonderfully reflected right into the water. Um, part of choosing a painting, and again, this is kind of trying to tap into the intention behind this painting, which I think is was captured really well to capture this dusk uh, scene on on the lake. I would try to keep the main thing, the main thing in the painting. And I think you've, you've wonderfully captured the, the kind of gray blue to orange to pink, both in the sky and the reflection, that the details in the houses, the windows, the chimneys, the roof lines, the decks, um, I don't need this much detail. And it, I think it's actually kind of distracting because of how well the sky and the reflection and the transition from the sky to the trees, the reflected trees back to the reflected sky, how well that works. I yeah. would minimize the amount of detail in the houses. Um, that would be my main uh, suggestion for this piece. I didn't do anything this time. Oh, really? Thank um, you. Thanks very much. And I think that 
my only kind of, let me uh, annotate this a little bit. This, oops. This area right in here, I think is at a really um, appropriate amount of detail. Uh, I especially enjoy this, this shape right here, this kind of um, more harder edge shape. This over here just seems like there's too much detail. Like we're trying to, uh, the artist is trying to put in too much. So I would just really think about, um, you know, what's the main intention behind the painting? And let's try to make all of those other decisions in support of the main intention. Um, I often talk about this as uh, compose a painting like you're casting a play. Uh, create a lead role and supporting characters. These houses are very much supporting characters to the, the quality and the colors of the light of the sky and the reflected sky. I would um, make them kind of more in that supporting role rather than uh, vying for attention. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, uh, similar scene from the same group of painters, it looks like. I was standing about eight feet behind Kuhn. Okay, I'm <laughs> glad you didn't say five feet because that would be less than six. <laughs> so right. eight feet is good. <laughs> um, yeah, great color palette, again, um, areas of analogous color and then that's broken by uh, strong pinks, oranges, uh, wonderful color temperature in uh, those warm greens. And um, <clears throat> again, nice little balance of um, breaking that color harmony with a little accent of uh, orange with that figure crossing the bridge. Um, I would be cautious about uh, the way repetition works in a painting. And repetition that's not necessarily the quality of the marks itself, but maybe the distance in between one mark to the next. Um, and what I'm referring to specifically is kind of the repetitive nature of these arcs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <clears throat> in painting, there's, you can let the viewer's eye fill in the gaps, maybe more so than we think we can as painters. So having like a mark that exists all the way or almost across the whole page like that. Um, it can be just as effective as marks that take on that similar shape and direction, but take on a, a much more, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a medium length mark, a longer mark, a shorter mark, a bit of bit more distance in it, uh, medium and, and have more variation in the length of that mark rather than one mark that goes all the way across. 
the viewer's eye will still move in that same direction and fill in the gaps. Um, so that's that's kind of one approach, and that can create a bit more um, visual interest than having uh, that one mark that goes all the way across. Um, let me get rid of this so I can see the top of the painting again. Yeah, and I would also think about unifying the cityscape a bit more in terms of, um, of value and color and um, maybe let some of that that kind of gray violet that you're using there, which is really quite effective as um, <clears throat> work that into the reflections a bit more. Uh, mm -hmm. This reflection seems a, a bit strong for the, the kind of shape and value of the, of the tower. Uh, generally how we view uh, reflections is that there's a compression of values compared to the thing that it's being reflected in the water. So the darks will appear somewhat lighter when reflected in water. The lights will appear a slightly darker. So that's what I mean by a slight compression of values as images become reflected um, in water. So, yeah, that's something to kind of, um, you know, make a mental note towards the next time you're kind of in a, in a situation like this, because um, that really does help not only read what's being reflected, but also maintain that plane of the, the surface of the water, uh, which you've got two things kind of in tension there. Um, you've got the, the imagery of that thing being reflected in the water, but then you've got the surface of, of the water, uh, which is a plane that is receding back into space. And there's many areas in this painting where that tension is created and handled really well. Um, I, th I think those some of those values might be just a bit bit too deep um, in the areas that are being reflected. Yeah. But I love the diversity of greens there. I know that that's something we've we touched on in the workshop that we'll be touching on again um, in uh, in a couple weeks. <laughs> Great, thank you. But by the way, I have frozen my palette from this, so I will. Oh, go okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> All right, my initial response and is just one of absolute you know, just freshness that I feel like, you know, that last little spot of water just evaporated off this painting and it was just painted. And that's such a great quality about plein air painting is just when a, a painting exudes um, kind of the, the spirit in which it was done and a certain freshness to, to the painting. And you know, there's, there's not an area that is overworked in this uh, painting. I like that there's areas that there's a bit more detail in. Um, the air, there's areas on the left-hand side of the painting where it's, you know, it, it's not fussed over. It's just, um, that there's marks and backgrounds there that are just implied uh, without being overpainted. Uh, the, the areas of 
of white that are coming through uh, that tree on the top left is really effective. And it just, you know, it, it just makes me feel like the artist had a pleasant afternoon painting this. Um, and so hopefully that was the case. Um, a couple things I would note is, you know, I, I really um, appreciate the transition from the warm greens at the top of that, um, that bush, all right, in the center of the painting, um, how the, the path kind of curves around it and then meets up again beyond it, heading off into the, the top right into the background, uh, as well as uh, the detail and the edges that are utilized in those foreground um, plants that come just to the right of that warm green bush um, over the, the, the viewing of the water, as well as the, the quality of the edge of that shoreline. Having said all that, I feel like if there's anything that maybe um, is a bit more detailed than maybe it needs to be, would be the, the, the tree line and especially that tree in the upper right hand corner. I think if that area was a bit more um, just implied rather than described, um, in the manner that the, the real kind of left edge of the painting is, then it would not only push that area back into space um, in the pictorial depth of the painting, but it would also just create a bit more of a, a dynamic uh, between what is in focus, uh, the, the warmth of those warm greens on that bush, as well as the, the, the plants that come up um, over and in front of the water. Um, if the area in the top right hand corner was just a little bit more loosely applied with some softer edges, um, especially that, that single tree up there, just kind of implied rather than described, I think it would really um, kind of propel the piece forward even more. But I always like that area of, of landscape painting where, you know, you've got areas that are described a bit more and have a bit more of an area of, of interest and focus. And then you've got areas that are um, just implied. Hey, there's something back there beyond that path, beyond that shoreline. The viewer doesn't need to know exactly what's what's back there, and sometimes that, um, you know, when when the viewer's eye is told less, then it actually is allowed to see more in a painting, and I think this is one of those those cases. Uh, so beautifully implied on the left hand side of the painting, though. Um, again, really fresh piece. I just, you know. Maybe it's something about the watercolor media. Um, it just has this wonderful freshness to it. And I just, it's the reason I love painting in watercolors and love painting plain air. It's just the freshness and this piece really captured that. Okay. Uh, this is kind of speaking my language in terms of subject matter uh, where um, kind of a, a wooded wetland type setting. Uh, to me, it's really those intimate areas where uh, land, sky, and water all kind of intersect to create some interesting compositions. Uh, what strikes me about this piece in particular is just the, the wonderful mood that it communicates, um, driven by the color palette. Uh, the, the greens, blues are certainly in the minority of the overall painting compared to the wonderful uh, violets and 
kind of subtle orange pinks in the background that work their way up into the foreground again. Um, just a, a wonderful example of how color can express mood. And I think it would have been a lot less interesting of a painting if it was, you know, depicted with um, you know, a lot more naturalistic greens or um, it just, it just really flows nicely with that violet being kind of that unifying force throughout the entire painting. Um, a couple uh, quick notes is, you know, you've got the way, the directions of all these branches coming together kind of in in this spot well the spot at the at the base of the trunk of the tree um that's kind of where the viewer's eye go and i think if you're going to take the viewer on a journey visually reward them with something so I would, and that could be a slightly brighter color, perhaps in one of these highlights on the land itself. Uh, it could be kind of a surprise as like a brighter violet or a brighter pink, some little note of color that rewards the viewer for making that, uh, that journey that's driven by the composition. Really nice piece. That's nice seeing the um, just another another view of it, another light on that painting on the, the easel itself. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, and this is starting to develop kind of a, a theme here is um, the way that what would otherwise be a very analogous kind of predictable color palette is broken by subtle uh, notes of colors that break that monotony between um, the greens and blues that dominate the landscape. So in particular in this painting, the uh, the oranges that creep their way into the, the foreground. I love that thin sliver of water uh, just behind those trees. Uh, the, the blues and violets behind the, the rightmost tree uh, there in the composition. Um, and, you know, with a, a pastel painting like this, you get to really explore uh, just a great diversity of mark making. And I think that that is something that um, a lot of oil painters can take note looking at pastel paintings of uh, the wonderful diversity that can happen in the mark making itself. So what I mean by that in particular is that if you use like the side of a pastel that gives you a, a different quality than using a sharp corner of the pastel. Uh, if you smudge a, a mark of dry pastel with your thumb or finger, that gives you a different quality. And all of that can translate really well as into oil or acrylic painting with kind of the, the, the quality of the edge that it's created. Are you making a wet mark? Are you making more of a dry mark? Um, how does the mark making depict space in a painting? Um, and I think that those qualities are handled beautifully um, in this painting. You know, the, the edges and the mark making of the foreground is depicted very differently than the branches um, in the sky and the branches against the, the sky in the background. Um, I would even maybe even take that a step further, you know, be a bit more bold with the mark making. 
a bit more bold with the and diverse with the shape of the marks. Um, and that uh, this artist uh, certainly has a handle on the medium. I would just be a bit more bold with it and see what, you know, this is kind of a corny analogy that I've used for years with students is like, there's that old game show of name that tune where the contestants had to name a song in as few notes as possible. But that's a really good challenge for us as painters is how do you depict that area of grass or that sky or that cloud with as few marks as possible. So hope that helps. Really nice piece though. And I think um, just great example of just fabulous mark making. Thank you very much. All right. Um, this is a really interesting painting and I, um, you know, I really love and am challenged by painting areas of, of moving water. Um, the first thing I, I want to take note as kind of a nice segue and continuation of the qualities that I talked about in the previous painting is just the wonderful handling of paint in the top of the painting right in here. And that is, um, hand, the paint is handled just absolutely beautifully. Uh, you can see on the right hand side of the top, there's less influence of the air and the sky between the viewer and that um, those trees in the upper right hand. And then as we move diagonally down to towards the left hand side of the painting, there's more of that atmosphere that comes into contact uh, with the trees and the quality of the mark making to depict the air and the color of the sky's influence on those trees as they recede is handled absolutely beautifully. Uh, so I want to make sure I point that out. Uh, the other thing that I would note as just an area of, um, of improvement is that the highlights on the water, th where it's used as kind of a light blue, almost light violet um, color, I would maybe, I think, I think that that color is maybe overused a little bit and think about how you can be a bit more judicious in attacking those really light values of those ripples of water and the white water that's created by the movement. Um, and remember that in a, a situation like this, it's those lighter values and the way that those light values move throughout the composition that really drives the movement of the overall painting. And I think that um, if many of these lighter highlights in the water were treated um, maybe just one value a little bit darker, and then that lighter highlight was just reserved for just some subtle, um, really light value highlights to really convey the movement of the water down to the foreground. It would be a, a bit stronger. Um, that color of that light blue or light violet, kind of a light lavender color is, I think just maybe a touch overused 
that it starts to minimize um, what could be really a really interesting subtle movement throughout the entire painting. Um, but just the edge work in the surrounding areas is just absolutely beautifully done on this one. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> Great Beach kind of uh, lakefront scene, uh, very moody in terms of um, communicating the exact time of day, uh, kind of temperature, humidity, all of those aspects that really puts the viewer right into the scene. Um, and you know, there's a great kind of narrative that's happening here, uh, mostly driven by, you know, the car being parked there. Um, a lot of those compositional elements of the painting lead the viewer's eye right to that element that to me, without it, is a very effective landscape painting. With it, it takes on a really narrative quality. Uh, once I, I saw this painting kind of previewing the, um, <clears throat> the images, I am I'm immediately thinking about the, the story and the narrative that it's driving. Like, you know, whose car is that? What's happening there? If they just looking at the sunset, like what's, you know, what's going on there? Those are all of those evocative qualities of the painting and the narrative that's driven by this painting that I think about. And um, I, I like too that there's a certain moodiness to the sky and to the um, treatment of the edges of the tree against the sky, the foreground that just all support this kind of mysterious narrative to the painting. Um, it, again, it's, it's trying to tap into the intention behind each painting. And, you know, I could, I could talk about color, I could talk about composition a bit more, but to me, the main thing about this painting is just the, the beautiful narrative that it gives. And I think it's, really effectively done and a great example of uh, compositionally and subject matter, let there be a main role and let other areas be supporting characters. And I think that this painting executes that really well. Scott, we're just a little bit out after eight o'clock, if you want to take a like a five minute break and get a drink of water or something. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, everybody. So we will be back at uh, 809. Sounds good. Hey, Kuhn, I was really aware of, I like your painting and I was very aware of being over your shoulder. <laughs> I like your too. Yeah, very different, the two of them. Well, different perspective, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I like all the color. Mm -hmm. Scott is wonderful. He, he just picks the exact point that I was hoping for. Oh, good. Yeah, this is really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I hope people will take his uh, course because I think he's amazing. Mm -hmm. and, um, I learned so much from, uh, I just had four weeks with him and actually we'll be taking another four weeks with him. Wow. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, I if you guys uh, are interested, there's a place called the Winslow Art Center that is um, out in Bainbridge Island in Seattle. And um, uh, I, I mean, they're doing these online classes that are amazing, so. 
Great. Yeah, I've, I've signed up for the class on the 25th, so sort of I'm okay. looking forward to it. Particularly yeah. if he tells us how to make decent greens, because it's one of my perennial problems is getting all those different greens. Yeah, isn't that true? Yeah, when, when I was talking to him about the class, that was one of the things we talked about was was uh, that that challenge for all of us when green is so much, of, I mean, look at our paintings today, you know, there's just so much green in our landscape. Yeah, I'm gonna sign up, Mary. All right, do it soon. I couldn't quite understand what colors he was talking about in Robin's painting with the water. Which ones? Yes, he kept talking about violet. I see a lot of greens in the water. He kept saying that hers, that you know, she should have taken, used less of one of the colors, but I couldn't figure out which color he meant. So I, th I think he was saying the overall color of the lightness and, um, uh, but there is some vol violet in it, but it was yeah, the, okay. light, the light white or blue. Okay, so he said to make it darker. Okay. Scott, yes, Scott, there's a, just a question about when you were talking about Robins, the one of the waterfalls, they were just asking which color, they were saying they didn't understand which color that oh, there was much of. Yeah. Because you were using the word, you were using the term about violets. Yeah, I mean, to me, it, um, and it could be just a really light, a really light blue that's, um, that's being used on the highlights of the water. Mm -hmm. And, mm. and it could, to, to my eye, it was kind of a reddish blue. That's why I said violet. It was radiant blue and a little bit of alizarin. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it is 609. So I'm going to get back going yep. uh, on this. And <clears throat> this is yet another just incredibly fresh painting. Um, and you know, it, it kind of speaks to me about some of those impressionist paintings that were done um, probably at a pretty small scale. You can really tell that you've captured the freshness in it. And this one speaks to that freshness um, in a really great way. Um, I think that the, the, what throws me off a little bit is that size versus that scale kind of um, relationship. Um, not so much with the foreground, especially uh, with like the, um, the two darker birds, the white duck on the foreground, and even that white, first white duck here um, in, in the water, the, the size of that duck on top, um, along with like the detail of the reflection, I think kind of throws off the scale and the perspective as I move into the background. I think that um, it, if it's that size, maybe it should be located a bit closer to uh, that that other duck in the water or made or if it's that that location and that um, specific placement I would make that a little bit smaller it seems like um, the the ducks get bigger <laughs> if if I was to read the perspective of the rest of the painting it looks like that duck in the background would be huge compared to the others so I think there's just that throws me off a little bit, um, but the whole like execution and the the whole feel of the painting is so incredibly fresh um, that I don't want to dwell on the perspective too much because it's uh, really just to me captures a really uh, wonderful kind of afternoon intimate scene in the landscape and um, 
I, I think that that's like the main driver behind it. Um, talking a little bit about area of emphasis uh, that's driven by color, I want to make particular note before I move off of this painting in one little area. I'm going to change the color of this one little area right here and one of my uh, color discussions in my class was not only creating color harmony but creating an area of color discord to drive attention to a particular area and right here between uh, the the beak of the duck and the shadow you've got this great tension between uh, kind of a bluish violet and an orange yellow that is probably the greatest um, and most intense color usage in the entire painting. And they're right next to each other to create a wonderful um, area of focus and an area of interest in the painting. So I wanted to make sure that I, I talked to that before I left this image, because that's really beautifully done right there. Okay, so you have about 20 left. Okay. You're using the arrows, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Are you, you're... Okay. Um, this one again, creates a wonderful mood to the, the, to the painting, the atmosphere, uh, the color of sky influencing the other colors of the painting. Um, I think Monet said it best where he said, uh, the color of air or the violet is the color of fresh air. And this, speaks to that really nicely. Uh, all of the compositional lines and the movement of the, of the whole painting uh, puts that area of focus in that uh, statue really nicely. Um, the composition, and what I mean by this is that it, it enters in from from the bottom through the um, through the path, then up into the trees, up into the sky, down into the foreground again where those flowers are, and then sends us right to uh, that that statue, which is kind of in the sharpest detail of the entire scene. And the way that the composition sends us throughout the painting and then rewards us to get to that area of interest is really masterfully composed. Um, so, you know, really great edge work, but the, the whole way that the composition drives the, the visual interest of the painting is beautifully done here. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. You bet. All right. I, you know, um, I, I love any excuse to go out and make a painting and that if somebody doesn't even have to go beyond their windowsill to make a painting, great. And, you know, this was maybe done from a photograph. I know there, there, there is a sketch in there too, but this at least makes me think of, hey, why don't I just look out the window and paint uh, the scene there? And uh, I think what's driving a lot of the interest in this painting is um, the, the relationship between the, the color in the, the florals 
in those baskets against almost that monochromatic approach to painting the background. It really puts the emphasis front and center on color, on the subject matter. Um, I would be, again, a little bit cautious of, you know, repetition and thinking about, are you using repetition to create a really strong pattern in the painting? Um, or is it maybe distracting to the uh, subject matter that you really want to describe? And I think that um, this is a, a time, this is a, an example of where, you know, I could kind of see it both ways. I think if the color was dialed up a bit um, in, in the background and in the vertical kind of negative spaces in between uh, the, the, the fence boards there um, on, on that porch, if that color was driven up a bit more, then there could be some really interesting patterning going on. Uh, look at some of uh, David Hockney's work. Uh, David Hockney takes a really you know, famed British painter, um, or Matisse, you know, is another great example. Uh, painters that take on um, almost a, a, a rudimentary rendering of the subject matter, but their emphasis is really on pattern and color. And those are two painters that are just, you know, masters of creating pattern with color. And so the organic shapes of the flowers against the hard edge shapes of uh, the, the negative spaces of the, the, the fence and the architecture behind it get some really great opportunities to just explore pattern. And I, I think in maybe another painting uh, of a similar scene, think about how you can be more bold with just creating pattern of color. Scott, do you have any other uh, painters that you really love because of their use of color? Oh gosh, well, that's a whole other two hours. But um, I think along with that, um, in that same conversation of Matisse and Hockney, I would look at um, Diebenkorn, uh, especially in creating shape and pattern. Um, Andre Duran um, was one of the Fauve painters, early 20th century. Um, I'd have to look up the exact spelling of that, um, but Yeah, those are those are a few that come to mind with uh, that emphasis of both shape and color. Okay, um, so this is a great example here of how the gray of the background and the gray quality of the greens really help to accentuate uh, the colors of the subject matter that really informs the viewer of what's important. Um, I love the liberties taken between the subject matter and this piece. I'm gonna just keep talking about the thumbnails here um, because I can, uh, because it's on the page and- um, Do you want me to I, bring it up? Well, possibly, yeah. I can keep talking about it though. I've got a pretty good mental image while we switch over. Um, but you know, look at, in thinking about the reference image here, there's, there was some really great decision making in terms of what's important, what needs to be simplified, and that whole gray treatment of the background of the painting is a really great way to offset the greens and especially the pinks of, um, 
of the trees in the foreground. Again, it creates a wonderful mood. Um, and, you know, those, just a, a wonderful sense of atmosphere um, that's created through the unifying effect of the gray background. Um, if anything, I would think about, again, of uh, repetition, um, clustering, spacing of each of those flowers, um, and how the, the overall uh, kind of spacing and quality of that of those marks drive the the viewer's eye throughout the painting. I think it's handled um, incredibly well in this painting, but it's a great opportunity to uh, think about you know if if the pink is the strongest color that's being used in that piece, um, how can we let that eye dance around the painting in a really unique way. So uh, this one looks like a maybe um, pen and watercolor sketch. And, you know, um, there's a certain quality about plein air painting, and especially as it relates to plein air painting and traveling um, that this piece really speaks to is, you know, you can, pe people spend a great deal of effort trying to find and travel to a really epic location to paint. And um, to go to like, or go find the perfect plain air painting scene. Other people, um, we'll just look across the street and paint the scene there. And I think that there's a great quality about that, um, that this speaks to. It speaks to the kind of vitality, the busyness, that kind of underbelly of, you know, an urban street scene. Um, you know, it almost looks like there's advertisements or posters on the wall there. Um, maybe graffiti, uh, it's just, you know, a really uh, great kind of whimsical approach to the painting, which is um, really captured in the looseness of mark making, the quality of color, um, and that's the spirit in which it's painted. And it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, think about also too, um, you know, those elements with keeping the same feel, you know, think about, you know, elements of, that can even enhance those qualities even more. Um, are there figures in the scene? Are there, um, you know, is there a, um, somebody outside this, this storefront? Um, like what else is happening there? Like what other elements can um, evoke and, and support the narrative of the scene there? Um, that's, those are things I would like to see in this painting. What's the time of day? What's the quality of light? Um, even bringing in a bit stronger color uh, in a really playful way that can start to ev ev you know further evoke time of day and the action of this of this street scene um, and th those are a couple of qualities but I, I just you know love that that you can just it almost looks like you're you, you painted this from a front seat of the car on the other side of the street and it has that immediacy, immediacy to it um, that I really enjoy. <clears throat> I, you know, I, it's a great reminder. Like, I just, I'm so fascinated by painting in all of its form that, um, you know, I love to see this type of diversity.
<clears throat> All right. Uh, this looks like the L in Chicago. Um, this one, <clears throat> one area that I would pay attention to a little bit in this in this particular painting is this edge i think with the exception of the tree which helps that edge of the painting where you've got essentially very naturalistic approach or and subject matter at the bottom of that line a very urban, hard-edged approach at the top of that line is a really nice um, juxtapose of, of images there and, and subject matter. Um, but that hard edge that I created there, which I'll, I'll take away now, almost makes it look like two different paintings. And, you know, certainly the tree helps to unify both the top and the bottom of the painting. Um, but over, as we move over to the left of that, it feels almost cut off. Um, I would think about ways to further kind of unify the more organic, natural aspects of the landscape with the more urban quality up top because it's a really great uh, juxtaposing of two different elements of the landscape together into one composition but I would just color wise and um, maybe the quality of the edges work to unify both of those elements a bit more. That's the thing that's kind of keeping me from um, really appreciating the marriage of both the, 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 the man-made and the organic in this piece. All right. Um, I saw that there was a reference image there, but it looks like this was um, maybe a, of some historic sites and and architecture. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's a big old chapel. Okay, cool. <clears throat> okay, there it is. Nice. It's actually a cemetery, but I thought it was a really cool building. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so there's things we can do with. Uh, how color exists in space and atmosphere in, influences color and how we see that. Um, and it also influences the, the type of edge that we use. Um, I think that the, uh, the shape of this roof in the, in the background, right here um, and the color being used I think is really appropriate for for that shape what I would do is maybe deepen the values a bit and this the the plane of of this shape a bit more to bring that forward which would make that roof line to the right of it recede back into space. It feels a little attached onto the side, like it's in the same plane um, of, of space. And I think, you know, you could do one of two things. You could lighten it, that would push it back. Um, but I actually think the value and the color of that is really quite appropriate. I would just deepen the value of that front kind of facade of of that chapel that's that's just to the left of it, that, the one where that has the red marks around it. Um, 
And, you know, I, I think that the, whenever we're in a situation like this where we have to make decisions on the spot of how much detail do you really incorporate into the scene? I think that um, a lot of this painting has kind of an appropriate amount of, of detail versus looseness uh, given the subject matter of the scene. Um, I think that you, you could deepen those values uh, like you did on the left-hand side here. In this area is a really nice deep value that speaks to uh, the, where that side of that structure exists in space. And I think that this transition uh, between here and here can um, be improved upon by increasing the contrast of those values. Really nice piece. Thank you. Another really nice fresh watercolor. Um, and, you know, one of the, the great hurdles uh, for learning how to watercolor is, is being, having the discipline to leave the white of the paper alone when you need to. And this painting really does that really well. Both in the foreground, uh, the area that's unpainted is just as effective as the areas that are painted. Uh, and also into the really light wash that exists in the sky and the, the way that creates atmosphere into the distant hillside is, is really done, really done nicely. Um, and just as I was, I was talking about in terms of that earlier watercolor that we talked, um, that, we dis that we viewed, this has the same quality of freshness to it. There's, it's not overworked at all. I think this one works really well in that balance of both action and inaction. Uh, where is there detail and where, it, you know, what's described versus implied. Uh, the foreground, beautifully implied uh, areas that are not overworked, that certainly with the warmth of colors uh, advance into space, but then you've got just that middle of the painting that is describing, you know, there's the, the various greens that are going on, the, the various vegetation, the subtlety of the roof line, um, the, the, the values that deepen um, underneath that tree. It's really nice that there's areas of, of action and then inaction. And this is, again, a great example of, you know, letting, letting the main thing speak for itself and not over cluttering it with too much detail. And, you know, that's easier said than done. And it takes a certain amount of discipline uh, to, to, and restraint for not including everything in the scene that one sees. I'm gonna guess that it looks like there's two different um, images of this painting. I'm gonna guess that this is a bit more accurate of color um, for me to take a look at. A couple things here on this one, a beautiful scene, by the way, just a uh, really great um, scene. It really puts me into this space. Uh, I really like that the composition drives me to that kind of pairing of a light value orange against that adjacent kind of mark of, of kind of a warm violet, almost pink, um, towards the horizon of the painting. Um, I would maybe soften the edge of those dark trees just above it to have a bit more influence of the sky. Uh, transition into the 
uh, recessed areas of land. Um, and then maybe bring a bit more of the violet, even the subtle quality of the, the warm greens and let that influence the grays of the, the clouds in the sky. You know, um, as color gets more muted and around the center of the color wheel, the actual optical difference between one hue and the next becomes quite subtle as you start moving into uh, into the grays and into that dead center of the color wheel. So we can take a lot more liberties with using uh, some, some violet grays, some blue grays, uh, some green grays into the sky and really relate um, the, what's going on with the sky and the, to the color palette that's used in the land. And that, um, you know, the, the gray of the sky doesn't always necessarily need to be a tint of black. Uh, that there's a lot more visual interest that we can create there by incorporating some subtle color variations within those grays. And that kind of strikes me about this piece is just bringing a bit more of those subtle colors from the landscape into the sky. Hmm. Scott, as you're moving on, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you'll be covering in your workshop? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the things I'm going to be um, covering is just dealing with the diversity of greens in the world. And, you know, we have to confront that as landscape painters. How much do we... Um, really dive into that world of greens and or how much do we um, offset those greens by maybe interpreting other colors or applying different colors to them instead of using just a straight dominance of greens. Uh, what's working really well in this particular piece, even though it is largely dominated by green, is some of the subtle violets that are influencing the greens. Um, violet, especially deep violets, are incredibly effective in mixing into greens because essentially you've got the blue of the violet that is cooling that green off as it works into some deeper shadows. And then you've got the red of the violet that is uh, decreasing its chroma. And so it's incredibly effective of, of balancing violets and greens together uh, to, to not only vary the, the temperature, but also the, the value and the chroma of greens. And this painting is doing that quite well. I, I would even take it a step further and say, okay, how can I bring in some more reds, oranges um, into it to further offset um, that dominance of greens? Uh, but really great kind of patterning and brushwork that's created in the sky in this piece. Um, like I, for, one example, that really strong, warm green in the foreground beautifully depicts the quality of light in it, um, but it, it's quite homogenous as too. So maybe break that up by throwing just a, a few marks of like, hey, how does orange influence that warm green? Um, or just a few touches of, of pink in there just to maintain the same value, but offset the color a little bit. When all the values read really well, we have a lot more liberty to play with color. Thanks, Scott. You bet. Mm -hmm. uh, one element that I think is really, um, underrated in painting is 
when the when you get a kind of an element of surprise in a in a painting and when i was flipping through images earlier this one was certainly an element of surprise this um boat all kind of lit up in lights like this as you know just a kind of a unpredictable subject matter for a painting and i really like that quality about it uh it, in i looked at the the reference photo a bit and i think one element that that could even make this um a bit stronger is to deepen the value of the 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 water especially as you get as you get towards the bottom of the painting um and also maybe as that with the distant shore behind the lights too and that will just enhance that figure ground relationship between uh the 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 lights and those strings of lights on the boat and then the surrounding areas uh one of the things that i talk about in in the workshop is how to, how to create light in a painting whether it's a, it's just the the quality of creating light in a painting, whether that's a exterior light source or an interior light source. You know, in this painting, it's the that light source is within the painting. So you're talking about a quality of luminosity that comes um, out of the the lights on that boat. And so how that shifts in both value and chroma from the light source to the surrounding areas is what supports that quality of luminosity. And I, I think deepening the value of the water and the landmass behind it would really bring out that quality of luminosity. Great. All right. Uh, it, here's another um, kind of like intimate garden scene, a little bit of architecture in the background. Again, I, I would maybe think about, um, I, I really love the, the juxtapose of that harder edge architectural elements in the top left, especially that dark uh, shadow against that kind of potted uh, flower on the top left of the painting and how those architectural elements are then juxtaposed against the organic um, flowers and bushes in the foreground. I think the, the, the question is, you know, how much can that fence be described or implied? And I think it would be a little stronger of a painting if it was more implied rather than kind of treated equally from you know left to right uh with all of those uh verticals and horizontals as being kind of uh treated equally in terms of not only the edge uh but also the distance from each vertical to each horizontal so i, th I think again that the viewer's eye will fill in quite a bit of information. And I think if that fence kind of was implied a bit more, the viewers, I would fill that in. Um, and I think the painting could be a lot stronger with less of that fence being shown. Uh, because there's a great dance of color that sends you all the way throughout the painting. Um, and the 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 reds and the blues, those kind of like straight primary colors that are in the foreground, give it a really playful movement throughout the entire painting. Um, the the fence creates kind of a visual and literal barrier between the foreground and the background of the painting. All right, another great. <clears throat> kind of moody atmospheric painting here. Uh, I would think about diversity of the yellows in the foreground. 
um, there's a great diversity in mark making uh, within you know the shape, direction, of uh, edges within those marks. I would think about diversity of color a bit more um, just to create more visual interest. So think about them in terms of um, maybe more muted yellows, brighter yellows, uh, cooler or greener yellows, as well as warmer, more orange yellows. And that will create this wonderful kind of diversity of those um, of those pieces of paint, which are scattered throughout the foreground of this of this image. Um, think about too about just adding maybe a few small little notes of the same of of the similar subject. Uh, but carry that over to the right hand side of the painting. So what I mean by that is If I used Some maybe slightly more orange marks here How can I just make a few of them continue more to the right hand side of the painting just to move the viewer's eye all the way throughout the composition. Uh, because the atmospheric quality of how the sky interacts with the land uh, through the, the horizon line of the painting does that really well. Um, but I think the, the kind of dancing of those flowers in the foreground can be brought over to the right hand side of the painting just to let the eye move throughout the entire painting. Okay. <clears throat> Again, a great diversity of greens here um, in this watercolor. Um, <clears throat> you know, think about the hardness of edge that's created um, against this kind of shoreline here and the water behind it. That might be a very hard edge in reality, in the scene in front of you that you're working from. Uh, but think about how that hard edge is working in the painting itself and functioning in the composition. Uh, does it serve as kind of a visual barrier to go from uh, the bottom of the painting up to the top of the painting? I think one of the things that works really well here is the continuation of some of these, of the kind of blue, blue-violet of the water, how that's subtly working into some cooler tones at the bottom of the painting. Uh, the the trees as creating a strong vertical from top to bottom works really well. I would just maybe soften this edge of of that rock line against the water uh, to to again support the flow visually throughout the entire painting. Uh, one compositional element when you when it relates to format of the painting is if you're working with a strong horizontal format you want to provide a couple, uh, one or two strong verticals and vice versa. If you're working with a vertical format, having a nice strong horizontal or diagonal will help offset the kind of bias that the format informs the viewer. Uh, and the, the trees are working quite well to, to create that, um, that nice strong vertical in a horizontal format. I would just think about the edge quality of of the four of that rock edge against the water. Okay. Um, in this particular piece, what I appreciate about this piece in particular is the light value that is applied to this little structure uh, right around this this group of 
my guests are um, of animals, you know, whether they're cows, horses, like, I don't really need to know as a painter, as a, as a viewer. Um, I think that it's, I can tell that, that I can see the subject matter there. I think there's the right amount of, um, of implied subject matter. Uh, but what's doing it, especially with that white value of that structure, with just a couple minimal marks, it tells me exactly where to go as the viewer. And the, the highlights and the, the treatment of uh, the, the animals around it is really quite effective. And it would be less so if there was a lot of attention uh, driven to the other areas of the painting. So if that, if the mountain in the background was in sharper detail or brighter colors, it would distract from the main thing. If the, if the trees on the right-hand side of the painting were in greater detail, it would detract from the main, kind of main event. So again, it's creating a kind of hierarchy of subject matter and what's important to the viewer and then letting color and edge and detail support that hierarchy that's being created. And I think this painting does that quite well. Okay, here we go. All right, so we've got some really nice, um, diversity of color here that breaks up visually the greens in the foreground. Uh, you know, one element in creating scene, in depicting scenes like this, where there's a really strong uh, linear perspective driving into uh, the, the distance is, you know, how, how are we going to you know, reward the viewer for making that journey. And, you know, that could be a, that could be a simple little mark of, you know, bright color in the background, something that is maybe unexpected. So take like a, a red, um, <clears throat> you know, really kind of bright red mark and even if it's invented, doing something that kind of rewards that journey back to the to the background, driven by that linear perspective in the painting, can be really effective. Uh, way to kind of keep the eye moving around and uh, give the viewer kind of that reward for making that journey uh, driven by the perspective. I would also, you know, the other thing that I noticed about this piece, there's a wonderful multi-directional quality of mark making in the foreground. And that's broken a bit by kind of the repetitive diagonal mark of the trees in the background. I would look to diversify, you know, the direction of the mark um, in those background trees as well, just to match the, the kind of vibrancy of what's going on um, in the foreground. Okay. Um, this scene kind of looks like close to home around the Columbia River Gorge area, um, but really, you know, beautiful thumbnails of the values. Um, I, I, this is a great example of like, you know, we don't always have to use greens. We don't always have to use blues. Uh, we can interpret the colors that we see out in the landscape 
uh, just to drive visual interest um, in the painting. So the way that the, the blues kind of um, are reduced to a, a cool gray in the background, and then that shift to really subtle um, greens as we move into the foreground and then into these unpredictable oranges and violets along the shoreline. Uh, it's just a really great example of how we can break that, um, that dominance of just blues and greens in the landscape. I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the eye basically moves right to this edge on the shoreline right here, which is where kind of our most intense colors live, but also the greatest contrast of value, light versus dark. Uh, to tell us, you know, where that area of interest is in the painting. And the, the whole composition supports that area. Um, masterfully done. Great. Thanks, Scott. By the way, Steve is next week's guest artist. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, in this particular piece, um, it, it's got a great mood um, that's created, a great atmosphere as those greens dissolve into the sky. Uh, the, I like the violets and cooler tones that are worked in the green as those uh, trees recede into shadows. Um, you know, the similar thing that I would say about like the um, the amount of detail in the dock. Does everything really need to be there? Um, how can you imply uh, the, the structure of that dock and the, the linear quality without uh, doing every little kind of vertical, um, every little line that you see in nature? Um, I think that the, the reflection is handled quite um, beautifully in the of the dock in the water and the trees in the water uh it's implied really nicely i i think one challenge for you is like okay i see that there's there's rungs that um are part of that railing of the deck do i really need to paint everything that i see there how can i imply that with maybe just a few marks to inform the viewer that something is there, but not be too explicit in capturing every detail. Thank you. All right. Um, I think this painting really supports a lot of what I've been talking about of, of creating a greater diversity of color to break up um, what we actually see there in nature. So the red rocks of the background really help to do that. But the area that I think is really interesting is how those rocks of the background converge with the foreground tree uh, to create some interesting shift between greens and blues and oranges and pinks uh, and warm greens. Essentially, uh, this area right in here as a great kind of playful quality of, of color that it gives the painting a really nice painterly, loose, fresh quality um, that really isn't limited to just that area. That's kind of the culmination of this, but it really exists throughout the whole painting. And as this kind of diversity and, and uh, movement of color 
how that supports the movement of the composition is incredibly important. And the more, and that's, that's what I really mean when I said at the out, outset of this is that color can be a great driver of composition in informing the viewer how to move throughout a painting. So um, this one's beautifully done in, in that regards. Uh, one kind of challenge I would have um, for this, um, uh, for Andrea, uh, Andrea here, is maybe th think to diversify the mark making just a bit more. Um, again, I think it will help this, help the movement, help the overall um, feel of the painting, just to diversify big shapes and little shapes. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of feels like, and I, I'm guilty of this too, and sometimes it's like, you get into the flow of the plain air session and painting outside, and you kind of forget to put that medium size or smaller brush down and, and work some bigger brushes into the session. And I think that that's something that could actually help the painting a bit, is just diversify the, the, the shape of the color and the shape of those marks a little bit more. Thanks, Scott. You I bet. appreciate it. Yeah, reference piece for this one. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I like the, the liberties that were taken with color. Um, in this painting a lot. So, you know, thinking about, okay, not everything is just that middle grass green, but let's, let's bring in some temperature variation. So there's that warmth of the greens in the middle of the painting versus uh, the, the shift to cooler greens and darker greens as you get to the perimeter of, of the painting is, is quite effective. Um, you know, in, in terms of decision making in the composition, you know, especially in plain air settings, within an hour or two hours, um, and to retain a certain freshness of a painting, you really can't incorporate everything. You, you need to make decisions, and there's always simplification simplifying that goes on um, and you know how much do you bring into a painting how much do you do you leave out um, I think that the uh, the field the flowers in the foreground uh, the kind of linear quality that the the trees give um, beyond that field um, as we move to the top of the painting, I think that that is, you know, th those are enough elements to create a successful painting. I think that, that things like the archway back there um, maybe muddy that up a little bit. And that's an element that um, I might just like leave out for the sake of what's happening in the foreground, uh, because it kind of, makes it difficult to read uh, you know what's happening beyond those trees what's happening beyond that arch um, and that's and I, I see that there is um, some success that the the artist had with the how to treat the foreground of the painting um, and then, I think that as you get towards what's going on beyond the trunks of those trees, how the arch plays into the scene um, is a bit more of a struggle. And at that point, I would say, you know what, let's treat the main thing as those flowers in the foreground and let's simplify what's going on in the background. And that's the decision that we make as painters. Um, and you know, utilize that artistic license that we all have. All right, another wonderful atmospheric scene. Um, the violets of the sky influencing the the greens and grays of 
the trees. Um, again, I, I would say the main thing in this painting is the atmosphere, is the way that the atmosphere is influencing the trees. Um, it's creating a certain mood. And I think if you, um, you know, it's hard to go in and change the format after you've done a, done a painting, but you think about how a painting might influence future work in the studio. And to me, um, sorry, that wasn't done very straight. To me, there's a really interesting square painting at the top of this that is all about atmosphere and the composition becomes a lot stronger. And everything that kind of goes, that exists below that line is kind of visually a distraction to the main event, which is the atmosphere that's created in the painting. So, you know, I often have, have noted that plein air paintings can be a means to an end. And this, you know, what's above this, that red line and that square composition could be an absolutely stunning painting that's done in the studio. And, you know, that's, that's a successful plein air painting to come away with that recognition of saying, you know what? Maybe there's things that aren't working at the bottom of this, but the, the, the top square composition that I can work with in maybe a future painting is, could be a home run. That's a successful outing, you know? So just recognizing the strength of a painting, strength of composition, uh, the ability to crop, crop visually, um, what could influence a future work um, is all part of the game. Thanks, Scott. Okay, again, I, this is one of my favorite subjects to depict is, you know, the movement of water and how the movement of water can support the movement of a painting. Um, in this particular situation and in this particular painting, um, just like the other waterfall that we looked at, it's those highlights of the, the colors that we use, those lighter value highlights in the water that can really drive the movement of the painting. So, um there's a th there's a thought a school of thought and an approach uh that a plain that a plein air painting should kind of unify all of the dark values in a painting that those should uh somehow kind of touch or visually move uh throughout a painting and i certainly agree to that for the most part that if not you know physically they should touch to, together they should at least relate to each other and it's those darker values that really drive how the viewer engages with the painting and moves throughout it in this particular painting it to me i think it's the lighter values that do that work just given the subject matter of of the waterfalls so um, think about, uh, again, if all of those lighter values of the, the falling water uh, were maybe one step darker, one step maybe that incorporated the greens of the water and the actual highlight colors were used a bit more judiciously and then it was those lighter values were really unified as we move from the bottom up to the top of the painting 
in a way that really supports the movement. So, you know, starting here and connects up here. and sends us back into kind of the source of that water. That's a really nice movement um, throughout that scene. And it can then be uh, supported by some of these highlights that you have around the edge in the landforms as well. So I would just think about unifying, you know, be, First, using those really light values of uh, of the water more judiciously, and also how to unify them to further support the movement of the overall painting. All right, so for this particular piece, I would really think about um, a value, value that creates, you know, light versus dark, that creates kind of a figure ground relationship. Um, and, you know, as an, as an example, um, maybe deepening the contrast and the values of that chair in the foreground to make that, that green of the, of the grass recede behind it. Uh, visually, that green kind of comes forward and is advances in space rather than recedes. Um, and then just, you know, paying particular note to, you know, the, the kind of linear perspective that, that buildings take on. You know, I think that, you know, I'm always, will, I will always kind of favor what works in a painting compositionally over the reality that we see in front of us. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the the composition and the painting is, you know, is the utmost importance. So you can make a really nice diversity of shapes and angles uh, within a painting, especially dealing with, with architecture in there, even if it doesn't match up to the reality that we see. Um, so I, I'm kind of like good there. Like I, I think that the the way that the the right hand side, especially uh, with the building and those angles, are carved up is it's actually a really unique way. Uh, the angles come in at, at different pitches, different diagonals. There's a vertical. All of those elements are really nice and diverse. I would just think about how does the value and contrast of one subject matter, how it relates to the rest of the scene, does that make sense? And generally, the areas that are closest to us are going to be in the greatest contrast. Areas that are further away will be in, in lower contrast. Is this the last image? It is. It is the last one. Okay. Let me uh, stop the screen there. So thanks for the patience and working through what is the Facebook of, you know, working through images like this. Yeah, we but. haven't quite had that before, but Scott, thank you so much. This was really helpful and to have your uh, sense of color and how you're using color was really, really um, both different for us and incredibly um, useful and helpful. So, and you can see on the chat that there's loads and loads of thank yous to you. Oh, good, good, my pleasure. My there pleasure. are also a number of people who are looking at taking the course and wonder about that they've, they've even signed up and gotten a supplies list and want to know about how are you, are we painting with you or are you going to have them paint between weeks? How's that going to work? Uh, so the, the first week is I'm going to uh, describe a, 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 and demonstrate a number of different color strategies, uh, some theory behind um, working with 
the palette of colors and utilizing these different strategies in a painting. I'm going to be doing some color mixing demos, uh, talking about that, that diversity of greens. I've got a really effective um, template that I've created that, um, that you can copy off and do kind of a color mixing exercise um, in utilizing and mixing greens within this palette of colors. Uh, so I'll, I'll be offering that. I'm also gonna be talking a bit about opacity and transparency and how that affects both the, the, uh, the values of, of mixtures that we can create and what that does to the space of, of and depth that we create in paintings. Um, and then I'm gonna give you kind of a number of kind of challenges coming and exercises out of the first session uh, that you can work on through uh, the course of the week between uh, the first and the second uh, session. Uh, we'll take a look at those uh, to, to kind of in the second session as, as a group review to see how you did. Um, but the, the second session will very much be kind of an exploration of some of those color strategies. People are asking what um, about the media. Does it fit for watercolor and for oils or acrylics? Uh, oils and acrylics, definitely. Um, the, I'm going to be basically teaching in um, oils, but I'll probably um, talk to a number of the different um, water-based mediums that I work into. Um, it, the, the theory that I provide will be mostly applicable to both oils and acrylics, though. And that's what I saw when I was taking your class, which I know this will be a little different, but um, uh, that's what it, it felt like. This was really about color, not about the media. Yeah, right, right. Good. All right, does anybody have any other questions? Um, yeah, I do. Um, when you started in the very beginning, you talked about casein and acrylic wash. Now, why, where would you use an acrylic wash? I do pen and ink and I do a watercolor wash. Would I do a, an acrylic because that's water-based instead of a watercolor wash? Oh, just to um, clarify what I said, I think I said yeah. acrylic gouache. Quash. Gouache. So G O U A. Yeah, I wrote that down. Okay, yeah. got it. Acrylic I heard gouache. It's the old years. <laughs> yeah. And, and essentially, what that is, it's a matte acrylic. It's a fancy word for a matte acrylic. Oh, okay. So. It's the acrylic binder, but it dries to a matte finish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. You bet. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Well, Scott, thank you On for your list. Me. You have um, gambling, and you can mix uh, Rembrandt or other brands with gambling. You bet. You can do that. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, pay pay attention though. Um, like color, a color like Indian yellow is pretty specific to Gamblin. Um, all the other colors would translate between brands pretty well. So yeah, that's fine. Great, thank you. You'll you'll talk about some of those things. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, I hope you will join us uh, uh, with Scott's class. So, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, I know it's earlier for you. Or for all of us, we're about ready to go to bed. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. I've got a couple hours left in my day still. <laughs> yeah, it's dinner right. time. Lucky you. And next week, we have uh, uh, Steve Puttrick, followed by Errol, uh, followed by uh, Andy Conklin. And then we uh, do have a couple other people coming up that are surprises. So um, I'll let you know about those people. So anyway, uh, thanks everybody for coming. And Scott, particularly, thanks so much. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. My Thank pleasure. You, Sounds great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank Take you. Care.